Welcome my friends, super exciting video today with Tom Peterson. If you don't know who Tom Peterson is, he's an absolute genius of a graphics card guy. He used to work for Nvidia, now with Intel, so he has absolutely tons of knowledge when it comes to graphics cards, graphics, all sorts of things. Just Google this guy and you'll know, wow, this guy's amazing. Anyway, me and Benji Kaiser have the honors to actually have a chat with him and we're talking about the newly released ARC GPUs and I asked him the very interesting question can we make the dedicated encoder card and you'll be surprised what he's gonna answer so this is gonna come up super exciting but before that a little word from the sponsor this video is sponsored by Riverside which is also the secret of recording these high quality video podcasts when people are located all around the world Riverside is a simple online recording studio that offers local recordings of up to 4K video and 48 kilohertz on compressed audio. So basically how this works is instead of you sending your compressed low quality video and audio across the internet to someone to record on their side, the video and audio get recorded locally on that side of you know the internet connection and then uploaded directly to the cloud and then the low quality video will be sent to other people for them to see which means that they get the best connection but we're still recording the best quality to the cloud so you don't have to worry about compromising on audio quality if the internet connection is bad use the built-in magic video creator to create the multicam view it's available on smartphones and on desktop we've been using and loving riverside so much that we asked riverside if they want to sponsor these videos and here we go so check out riverside.fm in the video description below and try out the free trial so the first question uh, to you Tom is um, as a creator and what my audience wants to know is how is Arc GPUs different from AMD Radeon and Nvidia GeForce like how does the Arc slide into there for creators? Well that's a great question for me Arc is all about platform integration if you think about uh, what's different here is that obviously it's an Intel GPU being coupled with an Intel platform so we can do some things differently uh, from how it's been done in the past we call these technologies deep link and deep link is all about finding ways to leverage all of the silicon that's in your platform for example when you're doing say media encoding um, there's already a media encoding block inside of your CPU that works when there's no discrete GPU. What we can actually do is now that there is a discrete GPU with Arc, we can connect the, the media encoding logic that's inside of Arc GPU with the media encoding logic that's inside the CPU and we can turn them both on at the same time. And that means that we can uh, decode or encode much faster than you would have on any other platform. That's called hyper encode. And, and it basically works through software where you kind of say, I want to encode this particular media stream. We're going to take a bunch of frames and we're going to encode them on the uh, discrete GPU. And then we're going to take another bunch of frames and we're going to encode them on the integrated GPU. And then we're going to bring those all together seamlessly. And it just makes performance go up by about 60%. So it's a pretty cool feature. That's called hyperencode. I'm super excited about that. I, just because I've been doing a lot of tests with the UHD 770 on the uh, 12th gen mm -hmm. chips. And I know that that encoder like supports more codecs in video editing applications than NVENC or anything else that's out there. So I'm super excited about that. Well, I was just going to say that's just one one example. Like, a, of course, we have a fantastic media block on our discrete GPU Arc. Anyway, um, it does all the latest codecs. It is high performance, high quality. We also support for the first time AV1 encoding natively on Arc GPU. So that means it's about 50 times faster than traditional AV1 encoding, and it, it enables a future where we're doing these higher quality at the same bit rate or a lower bit rate upload for all your streaming services. AV1 is something I was we were talking about. Can you bring our audience up to speed on where we're at with AV1, where it fits into like cameras and online video and what the kind of future is sure. of AV1? Uh, AV1 is a, a approved standard. It's across many of the largest uh, companies in the world, folks like uh, Google, Intel, Amazon, everybody. And um, where it is right now, there's some services that already have supported it for ingestion. So ingestion means I've, I've, got, a, a, I've got a stream and I want to send it to a service. 
um, what format do they accept? Yes. Right now, there's no like native services that are accepting AV1 for streaming. But um, for YouTube, as an example, they'll accept AV1 for offline processing, and then they'll kind of upload it later. So that's the kind of state where we're at. The uh, AV1 codecs are public, okay. but the streaming services are a little bit behind. Uh, not not behind. They're just they're just waiting for demand to mature. And what we're doing is saying, hey, okay. AV1 is an obviously better encoder. It gives obviously better quality. So we're all going to move to it eventually. But what has to happen is the hardware platform has to come first. And so we're building, yeah. Yeah. we're building it into our Arc GPUs. Maybe someday we'll William will move the codec into a wider uh, installed base. We ship the ma the vast majority of notebooks today are based on our CPUs. So that's a, a natural. Uh, progression of AV1 going forward. It's today. It is sort of future looking, where there's not a lot of native support in the services, but you can do native uh, AV, AV1 encoding today. We've already done integrations with M FF MPEG, which is the open source project that most people build their their kind of media application around. We've done Handbrake. We've done XSplit. We're working with OBS. So all of these uh, 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 software enablement efforts are already behind us. And the technology is available for use today on Arc. That's awesome. So it's it's showing Intel getting out ahead of the technology in this specific way. It's like, okay, you know, this is where we're aiming. We're aiming for the future. We're not just aiming for what works for this exactly. exact and that's, split second. That's, uh, there's a long history of Intel doing that. You can go all the way back to say, where did USB come from? Well, you know, USB was Intel saying, we got to clean up all this interconnect stuff. USB is the new standard. And when, when Intel did that, there were no devices. It's just like, hey, USB is going to be the way we go. <laughs> Same thing with Thunderbolt. You know, Thunderbolt is a is an Intel thing. I said, hey, we need to improve the way these docs yeah. works. It's going to be Thunderbolt. Wi-Fi is kind of the same thing. When we put Wi-Fi into Centrino, all of a sudden there's like a million Wi-Fi devices mm -hmm. and the Wi-Fi ecosystem takes off. So this is similar in the sense that we have to kind of shoot a little bit ahead of the market to enable substantial change. And, and that's where we're going. Now, shooting ahead of the market, does that sometimes put you... Uh, according to the consumer, perceivably behind in the moment? Well, 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 yeah. Or what do you think? Because there's a lot of people that might ask, okay, well, we just saw Apple launch M1, and it was really efficient. It has great battery life. It has great performance. So that's just a real consumer question. And I well, just Apple's a, put that a fierce you. competitor, and they're making great platforms. And we hope to be uh, kind of in the same place where we're making great technology, great platforms, and the, and the users are going to have to figure out which – which platform do they prefer? On our platform, you get the full, you know, experience that we deliver with Arc. You can, you know, run all the major media applications, and you can run leading games if you if you if you're into gaming. So, uh, uh, on the one hand, um, Apple is definitely a competitor, and we have to be effectively competitive with all our media features, all of our computation features, and our software ecosystem. And that's where it's it's really a huge advantage for Intel, just because the breadth of the software platform is so large. Um, but mm, again, it's, yeah. it's you know each some people are just kind of in the Apple ecosystem and they're going to stay there, and some people are are kind of in the Intel ecosystem and they're going to stay there, and that's that's just you know that's life. Okay, to yeah. take a little step awesome. back to those encoders and decoders, what type of codecs and bit depths and chromosope samples like are supported there? Because I've I'm looking at like what's Premiere Pro, for example, Adobe supporting at the moment. And at the moment, uh, the 12th gen UHD 770, there's only like four separate ones that might be supported. Now, the question is, is it Adobe's thing to support those things? Will Arc actually support everything and then the software developers mm. have to just, you know, roll out support for that? Or like what does Arc support in terms of? Like the basic the codex. codex. So um, on the hardware so side, we support VP9, ACV, HEVC, and AV1, and and a, a bunch of legacy codecs as well, right? But those are the ones that people are most mm -hmm. most curious about. Okay. We can do up to 8K 60 12-bit <laughs> HDR decode, and up to 8K 10-bit HDR encode. So that's like that is a full-fledged, you know, high-performance media block. It's got a bunch of technology that's sort of programmable in the sense that we can adapt to future codecs. But really, it's all about what are the current codecs that we support, and it's really VP9, AVC, HEVC, and AV1. So, like, how a lot of the video editors work in their um, timeline is that they often have to play back footage more than like the native speed, like two times forward, four times forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, where is the clip that I want? Okay, here mm -hmm. it is. 
So will will it be able to play that back 8K, like double the speed forward? Is that what we're saying? I, I think the way I, I think of it is it'll do 8K at 60 hertz. Now, it's up to the application okay, to do the scrub thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, Got it. if you want to jump forward yeah. in time, the application would kind of go shifting forward. It wouldn't really decode at 120 hertz or at 240 hertz. It would actually decode different pieces of the video. Okay. Okay. Is that the same on 4K? Yeah, it's same on 4K. So we'll do uh, 4K at 60 hertz as well, I'm pretty sure. So um, I know Intel's uh, very like known to work with some of the other softwares um, like Adobe. We mentioned that mm -hmm. before. What are some of the other creative software companies Intel's working with in terms of like their Arc GPUs to making sure that like Arc GPUs are going to be like well supported in their application well, for us it's it's a strategy that's all about enabling the layers so we obviously have already done the work with ffmpeg which is a key software enabler for you know millions of applications all around the world we also do uh, open vino which is uh, another layer that's adopted by lots of different uh, software companies for their media packages so for us it's it's get the layers done first that are our middleware for the audio and video packages we're also working with davinci resolve so you can see a lot of hyper compute examples on davinci if you're taking older movies or older content and you're looking to improve it using ai uh, davinci supports mm. uh, up sampling and also noise reduction and we showed a demo of davinci running on older videos from nasa of space you know spaceships taking off it's pretty darn Saw cool, that. right? It does a beautiful upsample. Yeah, very cool. Like it, it basically looks like it just kind of pulls the pixels t tighter, and it creates such clarity in the very video. Cool it's stuff. really neat. There is obviously the iGPU is inside this, a lot of the Intel CPUs. Yep. Is there obviously now Intel has both? Like AMD's got their CPUs and the GPUs. Nvidia has just GPUs. Is there any benefit for creators to going both? You know, Intel CPU and Intel GPU, apart from the, you know, iGPU, what you were saying, Deep Link stuff. Yeah, well, uh, Deep Link is more than just iGPU, but, but your, to answer your question first, most of the benefit comes from Deep Link style technologies, right? We're, we're looking okay. for ways to, to leverage knowledge of both what's happening inside the CPU SOC and in the GPU SOC. So uh, in addition to uh, hyperencode, we also support hypercompute, which is using all of the blocks of compute on different GPUs and, and CPUs effectively at the same time. Um, and we also have another technology called dynamic power share, which is let's share power effectively between the GPU and the CPU to get better performance overall, shifting it, knowing kind of like what's the critical path right now, we should have more power on the CPU or more power on the GPU to get best performance. Mm -hmm. And that's all because we control both sides of that puzzle, you know? So for instance, let's say I'm running inside a 4K timeline playback and my, my CPU would normally be at like 87% utilization. And my GPU, let's say, is at mm -hmm. like 15. Well, the efficiency would say, well, hey, let's throw some of the love towards the GPU and create more power and balance out the power distribution. Or yeah, the that's exactly it. And, and it's a, a bit complicated to figure out where do you, when do you move power from one to the other? Bec because there's a shared mm. thermal in a notebook, right? You have only so much uh, ability to cool. So you got to decide who are you going to let run faster. And it's it's sort of related to utilization, yeah. like which one's being you know used more. You typically actually want to shift power towards the device that's being used the most. And, and that's, a, that's a really cool technology, but we're really just in the beginning of that. As we do more and more platform integration, you'll see more technologies like that that are more efficiently using the hardware and the power budgets that you have in your notebook. So does this, uh, talking about laptops specifically, does this allow for cooler thermals? So a lot of times right now, the GPUs are actually the devices, if I'm not mistaken, inside of a computer using more uh, heat it definitely depends on what you're doing at the time like when you're when you're browsing okay. the internet it's mostly on the cpu but if you're doing say a transcode or if you're doing a encode it's going to be the gpu that's getting hotter although i gotta tell you with the hyper encode and with our encode media engines they're not that hot, right? The the really the times when the yeah. GPUs get hot are when you're doing rendering, like you're you're doing a blender run or you're doing some kind okay. of heavy duty compute. That's when the GPU will tend to get hotter. 
encoding, transcoding, there's really dedicated hardware that runs that very, very efficiently. And they're relatively low power compared to, you know, like running Blender or running some kind of Cinemark style style transcode. Um, so yeah, but it's it's super important to be able to balance that energy correctly even even in the middle of, of some operation because it always changes. You know, sometimes you're reading from disk and it's taken forever, so you'd be better off shifting that power to the to the CPU. Okay. And and what you mentioned about Blender taking a lot of power, is it the fact that we have not been able to discover a technology that creates more efficiency? Like is that workload so complicated that the technology has yet to kind of get there to where that becomes a simpler Yeah, that's a good way task. to say it. Blender is is doing uh, just very mathematically intensive manipulations of that data set. So if you're, if you're, if you're it, you know, it's okay. just billions of calculations to figure out how to, how to, how to draw pixels on a mesh, right? It's just a very heavy duty thing mm -hmm. to do. And all of that arithmetic has to be mapped to programmable engines. And whenever you have a programmable engine rather than a wow. dedicated hardware block, it tends to be more power intensive. And, and that's really what Blender's all about. Blender's okay. about being flexible and programmable and, you know, we can render anything. So that's, that's really where it becomes a programmable problem, which is typically a little bit more uh, power inefficient. So my, my kind of uh, last question to Tom before moving on to a bit more laptops is this. Has Intel ever thought about well i'm not sure if you're allowed to i can this, say anything I has want. intel <laughs> has intel ever <laughs> thought about uh, making a discrete just encoding decoding card whether it's pci through or something like that because like this to me as a creator is one of the most awesome key features and someone who maybe would love to have just the encoders mm -hmm. I don't know. My brain just goes, obviously, I'm not like that technical, but can't we make like something that's like M.2 slot type of encode, like encoding, decoder card, put it in there. They don't run that hot. There's plenty of bandwidth, you know, that we can get PCA Gen 4. Now we're talking about PCA Gen yep. 5. Could it work? Uh, first, let me ask you, answer your question directly. Yeah, you can certainly do that. It would certainly work and it would certainly be really, really cool for, for creators. There's no question. So I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news, the the good news is <laughs> I can totally do it, and uh, and if if the market matured to a point where there are a lot of people that want that, then we would certainly look at that as a product. Mm. The bad news is that that's not uh, there's not a sufficient demand right there today for for as far as I can tell for us to go build that custom piece of silicon. But there's one last hope I'm going to leave you with. In the future, GPUs are going to be much more. Um, disaggregated and what that means is we're going to be not building one big chip but we're going to be building chiplets like little littler pieces of silicon that you you tile together on a package or maybe on a board and uh that's the gpu the gpu is a collection of chiplets perhaps right and hmm. and if that's the case then it actually becomes much more um, cost effective to make very market specific devices so if we had built, like if we had taken um, this chip, Alchemist, and instead of building one chip, let's say we had made it up of five chips. There could have been one chip that has like the, the XC cores, and we could have made another chip that was the media engines, and we could have, we could have stuck them all down on a, on a piece of, of board and made the big thing, right? We didn't do that, but we could have. And then we could have potentially taken like 10 of the media engines and put them down on a custom piece of substrate, and that would have been a, a media accelerator. It's certainly possible. It's not happening today, um, but, you know, it's not impossible. So that would make it more possible in the fact of it'd be a wider market fit because you'd be able to just add maybe two sections that are for what Lori's asking, and then the rest of it could be for the billions of other people who find yeah, value in that It's almost like component. once you start thinking about future semiconductors may be modular. And if they're modular, you can you can have market specific mm. variation that uh, you know can get can service totally. smaller groups of people with more customized silicon. And I, I I don't know if the media accelerator engine market is ever going to be big enough to do that. But you know what? There's lots of people that are going to get custom silicon, not custom, but like customly configured silicon for that specific segment as we as we go forward. Yeah. So it'd be more, like you're saying, more modular. So it'd be like saying, hey, I want 32 gigs of RAM, I want 16, except we're saying, hey, I want to add the media encoders to my unit. 
Yeah, or you could you say know, yeah. Intel. Okay. Very cool. Someday we might have a media, um, a media chip set, like a media market that we would say for for creators. We have the uh, Charlie Charlie Creator package, right? Charlie Creator die, and what that actually is is maybe one block for doing all the graphics, but then it's got ten blocks that are doing decoding or encoding, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. someday. That maybe. would be neat. I like that. You guys are crazy. That would be interesting. I just think it would be interesting because I'm thinking there's so many devices that run uh, video. You know, like we have TVs and Playstations, all sorts of things. If those media encoders are more efficient than whatever the other, you know, processor is that plays back those videos, that could be an awesome product. You know, just slot it in and maybe even your old device can play back now suddenly 8K or, you know, just because you can upgrade your media For encoders. Sure. But to kind of uh, segue into the next laptop segment is why did Intel release the laptop GPUs first rather than desktop GPUs for the Arc? Mm. Because often that's the other You're way around. You're absolutely right. So if you thought this was the end of the conversation, actually, this is only part one of the conversation. Me and Ben had to split this conversation between our channels and the second part of the conversation and Tom's answer to this question is actually available right now on Ben's channel. So check this video out on Ben's channel or click on the card on the screen right here and then you can see the second part of this conversation. So feel free to go check that out. It's available now. Go, go, go. It's all the, on the playlist as well, so you can find it on the playlist. Okay, bye.